Welcome back to another episode of the Junior Future Podcast. I have uh, Anthony Passano here with me. He's a, an amazing engineer, turned entrepreneur, has his own management company, he's doing a lot of great things online. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, Anthony, I just want to uh, describe what do you do, um, what do you do with Engineering Management Institute, and some of the things you're working on right now. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me, Luis. I appreciate it. And so my background is a civil engineer. I worked for a consulting company for some time. And you know, I wanted to become a leader in my firm. <clears throat> and when I looked at the other leaders in my firm, it was really obvious to me that they had skills beyond their technical skills. They could communicate mm-hmm. effectively. They could lead projects. They could lead people, most importantly. And so when I saw that, I started developing those skills. I read any book I could read. I took any course online I could take. And um, my skills started building and my career started taking off. And one day my boss came up to me and said, hey, we love what you're doing. You think you could provide some training on these skill sets kind of within the company here in, in other offices. So mm-hmm. at first I kind of said no, because I said, I'm an engineer, <laughs> I'm not a trainer. Um, but I eventually convinced myself to do the training. And basically two things happened. Number one, I loved it. But secondly, we saw results, better client correspondence, better team communication, better project performance. And so I decided to go to executive coaching school in the evenings and I joined Toastmasters And I built an internal management and leadership training working with our HR director. We conducted it for about a year. And one day it just hit me that if there's this many people in one company that are struggling, there must be thousands of them out there. So in 2009, I left my engineering career. I started what is today the Engineering Management Institute. And I've traveled around the country helping engineers become better leaders by developing their people skills, their project management skills. And one of the things I try to do, Luis, is I try hard to make everything that we do, whether it's we have three YouTube channels, we have four podcasts, we have a lot of training programs, make them engaging so that when you get that information, you can actually use it in your job as an engineer. Because when I was an engineer, I remember getting sent to these boot camp trainings. I would go for a day, I'd get a lot of information, I'd get a binder, I'd go back to my desk and I never get to open it up again because I was just too busy. So everything that we do at the Engineering Management Institute is very focused around how Will engineers be able to take this information and use it in their careers and in their lives? Yeah, and I think that that, that topic is just super important. And again, the more I talk with engineers, kind of in, in our space, uh, we're, we're really focused beyond what your typical engineer is doing uh, on the soft skills, the life skills, whatever you want to call them. The more I talk with more people, the more I realize that we all have the same mindset that even if you just want to be an engineer, if you just want to work on technical, stuff at work, you need to develop those skills to get to the next level, to become a project manager, to find more opportunities within the company. And a lot of people miss that that part of, of the career, especially young engineers, they don't really know what they need to do. Um, so I want to be I want to talk touch on that, especially uh, from the company perspective, what can companies do to help these younger engineers that just graduated from school first first time with a full time job? What is the first thing companies need to do to help them understand the importance of these skills as well as provide the tools they need to develop those skills? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's an important thing because you need well-rounded engineering professionals today because our projects are getting more and more complex. And so at younger ages, earlier in their careers, engineers need to engage with clients. They need to make presentations. They need to lead teams. So it's very important that companies establish some kind of consistent learning and development programs around these skill sets as early on as possible for these engineering professionals. And what we recommend at EMI is having some programs that have different levels. So a level one program might focus on communication skills and how to start developing your speaking skills, maybe start developing your networking skills, maybe even some time management training. And then, you know, as they progress in their careers, maybe they're going to become a project manager, then they need to get PM training. And they're going to have to lead people. They're going to need to get more high-level leadership training. The thing is, though, is it has to be done consistently over time. It's not an all-in-one training. It has to be spread out so that they can keep practicing these skills. And for those companies that are worried about all the training, what we try to do at EMI and what you could do with your own company if you build internal programs is have your professionals practice what you're preaching on the job, right? So, for example, we have like an active listening segment where we teach people how to listen better and then we challenge them, do it on your next staff meeting, do it on your next client call. So it's not like you need to go and do something that's non-billable. You can practice it 
while you're actually working. The other thing that I would mention for companies is to think about developing a formal mentoring program. Mm -hmm. We've been working with quite a few companies on this because a lot of people will say, oh, we do a lot of mentoring for our engineers. But then when we talk to the actual engineers, they say my boss is too busy to mentor me. So I don't really don't get the mentoring that they're supposed to be giving me. So if a company can formalize the mentoring program, even if it's monthly meetings, um, I think it's really beneficial. Some of the companies that we've worked with or that I've seen do this, they have like a contract or a simple agreement between the mentor and the protege, a confidentiality agreement. You meet with that person once a month. You can get some mentoring. You can get some guidance. It's much more formal than just saying, you know, hey, we're going to mentor you and teach you whenever we can because unfortunately, whenever we can, usually it doesn't happen because everyone's so busy. Yeah, mentoring is one of the things that I really enjoy from the company I'm working over now. I just finished my two years kind of cycle. Um, they, they assign you a mentor when you started the company for two years. And I think it's just an opportunity to have a conversation with someone, especially through the pandemic. That's kind of where I started that you wouldn't have otherwise. You're not really walking on the, uh, on the office and like bumping into people. So it's kind of hard to have those like closer connections. Uh, so I think that mentoring aspect, just having a more formal aspect of mentoring was helpful to just understand some of the things that may have not been as obvious during the training. And we tried to spread the training over a year and just kind of, it, it's, it's hard to train people in like two weeks and expect them to remember everything for the rest of their career. So finding mentor, I think it's, it's a great way to, to help these individuals to develop their skills. Another thing we do a lot is send people to conferences, uh, showing them the value of attending webinars. We have like a monthly webinar. Uh, we also have like technical topics where we present um, just internally people that have learned new things and then just kind of present with each other. So I, I think we do a decent job of helping, especially younger engineers, to figure out how to develop those skills. Uh, but I think mentoring kind of ties everything together in a way that the the engineer, the young engineer feels comfortable when they meet one-on-one -on -one with someone and they know they can basically ask anything on the job. I think that's that's been one of the main things that I've enjoyed. Uh, from from my early experience in at the company. Um, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. One one other thing, Luis, I want to mention on the mentoring side of things is, and that's great that your company does that. They assign you someone, so you have that kind of formal mentor. I've seen a lot of companies and larger companies where their philosophy is, you know, we rely heavily on mentoring and like on the job learning. Mm -hmm. The problem, though, is that, like I said before, it's not happening, right? Because everyone's busy. It's not a formal program. You weren't assigned anyone. So they're assuming that the managers are mentoring the younger engineers. And it doesn't happen. So what happens is, from a younger engineer's perspective, the company's telling them, you're going to get mentoring, you're going to get mentoring, and they don't get the mentoring. Mm -hmm. They get frustrated and they end up leaving the company or they end up not developing properly. So I would just say that if you're, if you're, you know, if you're a leader in a company, you know, establish a program, make it formal and make it consistent because, you know, it's not, not only will it work, but you need to support your staff. And if you're not doing it, they're going to go somewhere else where they can find those formal programs. Right. Uh, and let, let's touch on that because I think that's a super important topic. I've seen companies, again, find like a formal uh, mentoring program like we do. There's company that has like a more, more loosely definition of that. Uh, what is your advice for a, a maybe medium to large size company where it may be a little more complicated because of logistics to set up a, a mentoring program that works and is actually showing results for the uh, young engineers? So first of all, I think anybody can do it because it can be done remotely, right? We learned over the last right. couple of years that you could do basically anything remotely. So it's definitely possible. And what you can do is rotations. So what you could say is, hey, you're going to have a mentor for six months and maybe you pick 30 or 50 engineers and they get mentored for six months and then you do a rotation and you pick another 30 to 50 engineers. You can't maybe do everybody at once. You have to be have some kind of a rotation, but it's definitely doable and the company has to commit to it. And, you know, maybe if you have multiple office locations or profit centers, however you define it, you can have someone who's kind of the sponsor for the program in each of those locations to really get it going. But I think what the company really needs to understand is that there's a tremendous amount of value for the company in developing a program like this, because as I said before, you're going to develop your staff, which is just going to be great for your projects and everything that goes along with that. But you're also building a culture with your staff where they know that you're supporting them. They have the growth and development support they need, and they're going to want to stay at that company long term. And really what we're finding in today's world, Luis, is 
engineering professionals want to work for companies that support their career growth more than anything else, more than the title they get, more than the salary that they get, more than the benefits that they get. Because honestly, all companies today give pretty good <clears throat> salaries and benefits and things of that nature. It's those other things like the mentoring, like the learning and development programs, um, like any kind of flexible flexibility you can give them. And so those are the things that matter and you need to focus on those. And oh, by the way, if you do it well, it's only going to help your company grow. Yeah, and I, that's that's a good point. I don't think a lot of engineers really, especially when you're just graduating from school, realize the importance of that aspect. Um, obviously, through the pandemic, uh, our family has been growing. We we just received our third children this past November. So having that support has been even more valuable to me than a ten twenty thousand dollar raise, just because I'm able to spend time with my family. I've been able to be home. I've been able to do all these other things that. If I were in a company that didn't support me or my career or my personal personal um, wants, it would be really hard for me to set that company because I'm just gonna feel forced to go to work and and not have like a life outside of work. So I think that's a, that's a really interesting point that a lot of people, especially younger engineers, don't really realize until they're stuck in a company that uh, basically doesn't support them at all. Yeah, no, it's 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 the most important thing right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, companies need to recognize that. And the companies that recognize that are going to be the companies that grow um, the fastest and, you know, will last the longest. And we have so many <clears throat> conversations with engineering professionals, which is why we know what they want. The other thing too, that I tell companies all the time is on your career, career page on your website, you need to have a emphasis on the career development programs and support that you have. You know, like if you go to someone's career page on their website, typically all these engineering companies talk about the benefits and their salaries and things of that nature. But I always tell them, well, do you have project management training? Put it on there. You know, do you have flexible work schedules? Put it on there. Like you have to think about what people want and speak to that <clears throat> so that you're, and, and obviously develop those and do what you say you're going to do. And I think that's a big part of this industry going forward because there's plenty of work out there right now. A lot of companies are busy. So, you know, engineers have a lot of options. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now let's talk about like the younger engineer that is just graduating. Again, have maybe found a company that is very supportive, that provides them all the tools they need. Uh, they find that the mentoring program is great. What can they do to make the most out of this experience? finding maybe volunteering outside of work, bringing some of those skills that they learn outside of the job to the job and how they can start developing and really polishing those skills that are super important. Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously to some degree, <clears throat> this will be dependent on, you know, what the company does for them. So hopefully their mm -hmm. company has some programs, but even if their company doesn't have any programs, get involved in a professional association, right? Like an ASCE or so whatever, you know, your discipline you're in. By getting involved in those uh, organizations, you're going to build a network. You're going to meet people. You're going to be forced to develop some of your networking skills, maybe your speaking skills if you become a leader in a chapter, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just going to give you the ability to maybe find your own mentor. I mean, that's the other thing. Like, You don't have to be in a formal mentoring program in your company. You can actually find someone in an industry that will mentor you. So <clears throat> my biggest recommendation to younger engineering professionals is get involved in your industry. Join, not only join an association, but take on a leadership role in your chapter because that's going to force you to develop and that's going to force you to meet people and that's going to force you to grow in a lot of ways. And I also recommend that actually you try to find a mentor external to your company, even if you already have a mentor within your company, because you can get different perspectives, like a very diverse, it's kind of makes your career much more diverse. And what I find is that sometimes as a younger professional, there's questions you have, <clears throat> you may be uncomfortable asking your supervisor. Maybe you have like a challenge with your communication skills and maybe you just want to bounce it off someone else or you have a conflict with someone in the workplace. So I think it's very beneficial and you get involved in an association, you build up other colleagues, maybe an external mentor that can also help to guide you in your career. Yeah. And to that, I will add something that I've talked many times here on the podcast and I share with other people is it's important to have a uh, a mentoring relationship that is official that you communicate frequently uh, but something i like to do is just follow people on social media that are doing interesting things like you learn so much from their work you learn so much from what they're sharing uh, you get to know their network and how they are connecting with other people so you expand your network as well you start just learning different perspectives and it's super valuable to 
obviously social media can be used for these great things, but at the same time, they can be used for bad things. So make sure you are, you're using social media smartly. You, you just find people that are interesting and follow them. And even if it's not like a official mentoring relationship, it's just super interesting to see what other people are doing, how they're helping others and, and just a, a different way to think about mentoring. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. And that's why diversity, equity, and inclusion is a big topic for today, especially in mm -hmm. our world um, of engineering. But it, the same thing goes like for your own career, right? You want it to be as diverse as possible. You want to meet as many different people as you can because, again, it enriches like your experience. I mean, not just career, your life experience too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're, we're about halfway through the episode and uh, I usually like to ask the guests to share like a funny story or like interesting story. And uh, you shared one that was, was super curious. Do you want to just expand on, on your story of how you found your first job? Yeah, sure. My first job. So when I was in high school, I had a friend and his father was a civil engineer and he had a small civil mm -hmm. engineering company. And at the time, you know, I was thinking about engineering. I liked math. I liked science. And so one day my mom said to me, you know, so-and-so's father's a civil engineer. I'm going to call him and see if he can give you a job. <laughs> and so of course I'm telling her, no, I don't want like my mom calling this, this, this kid's dad. So my mom called and sure enough, he needed some help. So I took a job there and I started working there in the summers as a surveyor, um, you know, going out with the field crew in high school that prompted me to pick civil engineering in college. And I ended up staying on with him through college as an intern. And then right before I graduated, a larger firm at the time was called Mazer Consulting acquired his firm and they had great benefits and, you know, they had a multidisciplinary firm. And so I ended up working with them for that company for 10 years. And that was the only right. company that I ever worked with as an engineer. And then, and then I left there to start doing the coaching and training. Yeah, what I love about this story is like, yeah, I mean, as as a high school student, it was probably uh, not not the best way to find your first job. Like, you, you didn't want to appear that your mom find you the first job, but that just shows the power of networking. Even if you're just a high school student, I mean, your network may be small, but like, you have your parents; they can talk to people. And ultimately, I think networking was what got you your first job. Even if it was just through your mom, which may not seem like the usual way we network uh, in this day and age. I think that's a super uh, just interesting story and, and shows that networking really is, is the way to find jobs. And I think that's the easiest way to find jobs in this complicated market. Yeah. And quite frankly, if I didn't get that internship, I don't know if I would be doing what I'm doing today. I don't know if I would have been a civil engineer. So really, you never know what happens in life. That's why it's important to build your network. Like you said, you know, meet a lot of people and build relationships. Yeah. And I think most importantly, also like stay in contact with those people um, something like, for example, the job I have right now, I had to apply for two years before I actually got it. I stay in touch with them um, for different circumstances. I have to leave my other job and just reaching out within 48 hours, I already had um, a contract signed, which is it just purely networking, staying in contact, uh, not burning bridges when you don't get accepted into a company. Again, this is, is a completely different topic, but just something that people just need to understand, especially young engineers trying to find a job. There's always a second opportunity. There's always another job down the road that is going to take you to where you want to be. Uh, I want to talk about volunteering because this is something that I'm very passionate about, especially as a young engineer that um, is still under, like trying to understand the skills that are needed to become successful, to be better at, at work. How does those volunteering can help young professionals at work, even if it's just a completely different aspect of engineering. Yeah. I mean, volunteering is important for a lot of reasons. One of them being to your point, it does again, force you to develop skills that you're uncomfortable using, right? A lot mm -hmm. of us as engineers, you know, we're not that comfortable networking with people. We're not that comfortable speaking in public. I mean, nobody is really, um, yeah. you know, we're not that comfortable having higher level conversations, maybe with, you know, people that are more experienced than us. So when we volunteer, a lot of times we have to do all those things. And I actually did a podcast about this recently. I found that the you know, best way to grow in your career is to do whatever you're uncomfortable doing, right? Because that's usually like what we need to do. And I feel like volunteering allows you to do that. Now, the other thing about volunteering that I think is really important is, volunteering is very enriching in that, you know, it's very satisfying because you're helping other people. 
you're giving back maybe to your community. Maybe you go to a school and you're able to teach or teach them about engineering and what engineering is. And so I think that there's definitely something to be said about that in terms of your career fulfillment, your enjoyment in life is helping others, I think is really a key way to, you know, go about life. So volunteering just has so many positives to it. And if you think you're too busy to volunteer, again, I think it's very beneficial for you and you're only going to better yourself because of it. So it's not like, you know, it's something that you should make time to do. Yeah. And again, I've talked about practice line a little bit in previous episodes. Like you may think you're busy right now, but you add something else and you're going to figure out the time to do both things. And also there's a breaking point to, to the law, but I, I do the podcast. I volunteer a lot. I have a family, I have a job. And it's not like I have 30, 40 hours a day. I still have the same 24 hours as everyone. But the way I'm, I'm trying to optimize my time, create systems to do all the things. So even if it's just add volunteering, again, I volunteer a lot with ACE. It may take me five, six hours a month to volunteer. So it's not like a, a big time commitment. And the value I get from that is just amazing. Uh, just networking with people in the area, being part of committees at the national level. And I think something you mentioned is really important because I talk with owners of companies. I talk to engineers that are, have 30, 40 years of experience. I talk to other younger engineers. So I'm practicing communicating with these owners of companies. So when I go back to the company I work on right now, work for right now and talk to the owner company, I'm going to feel more comfortable talking to him. I may see him that my communication skills are better. Uh, simply doing this podcast, I think, has increased my communication skills tremendously. Just coming from a different country, English not being my first language. There's just so many benefits that are not really seen or explicit when you're volunteering, but with time and with, with just being strategic and, and putting the effort in, you're going to see a tremendous amount of value on the other side. Yeah, for sure. And, and one thing that I'll, I'll just mention again about the volunteering is I think there's a component of it that's underrated, which is when you volunteer, it makes you feel good. You help people, it makes you happier, mm -hmm. but nobody seems to talk about that. Right. Yeah. Like everyone's looking for some kind of like metric result. You know, you're going to make more money. You're going to do that. But there's, you know, I mean, the whole, what's the point of your career if you can't enjoy it? So if you go volunteer, you're at a meeting, you're talking with colleagues. I mean, I'm sure you made many friends through ASCE that now you have yeah. friendships with, right? That are beyond work. So I think we need to remember that part of work and volunteering and getting involved with associations is making friends through your work that become friends outside of work. Right. And and not only that, like one of my favorite organizations to volunteer with is Engineers Without Borders, and it has nothing to do with structural engineering. Uh, is in a different country, so even the codes that we use here don't even apply. But just going to those countries, seeing those communities, and how they react to like our basically simple engineering solutions, and how it changes their lives, their perspective, their mindset, everything is just the most satisfying thing I can do in my career. And it's all because I just put myself out there as a student. I said, I want to be in this uh, student chapter. I want to volunteer with them. That led me to travel to Bolivia a couple of times, help the communities there. That led me to see that Indigenous Rural Borders was more than a, a college club that I was part of. It was more of a national organization that had projects in hundreds of countries with, with tens of offices all over the world, helping these communities in various aspects of civil engineering. So, Again, it's hard to quantify that, but when you look at your career, you feel more fulfilled. And I think ultimately you are more happy when you go back and do your actual job. You feel more fulfilled, and especially if the company is supporting you through all of those. I think that's one of the best things that any engineer can do. Yeah, I agree 100%. Okay, so we've been talking about students and when they graduate, how can they develop their skills? Uh, do you have any other type of maybe activity beyond like volunteering, having a, a formal mental relationship at, at the job? What are some of the things that both the companies and the engineer can do to really take them to the next level? So I think that one of the things that companies can do and with their staff is they can lean on their staff to help with some of these programs. Mm -hmm. I just recently interviewed a, a civil engineering CEO for one of our shows, and I asked her a little bit about diversity, equity, and inclusion and how their company addresses that. And she said that we have a committee of employees and we kind of leave it up to them to let it evolve and figure out what we're going to do. The same thing with, you know, hybrid work environment. 
We have a committee right. of employees that are helping us to figure out how we can be more flexible. So I think that really companies need to engage their employees with all of these initiatives, whether it's learning and development programs, a mentoring program, and have them get involved in building these solutions. Because if you do that, I think everybody, get, it's a good exercise because everybody has to work together. And I think when people are help in developing a program, they're more bought into that program. They want to see the success of that program. And you're, you know, you're giving them, you're kind of putting them to work. If they want mentoring and learning and development programs, that's fine. You want to have them involved in helping you build some of these programs. And so I really would like to see kind of more partnering between companies and their staff on some of these initiatives that are really important in the industry today. Yeah, I love that idea. And I don't think a lot of, especially the bigger companies do that because obviously their engineering staff is busy doing the engineer work, uh, which led to maybe not have the enough, the, the skills they need once they become managers and maybe they're not the best managers. And it's kind of a, a vicious cycle in, in that sense that you, when you start as a technical engineer, you not get enough skills, then you become a manager and it's kind of hard to balance everything. And then comes burnout, mental health issues and everything. But I love the idea of having committees for engineers. And I think I've seen this quite a bit, especially in smaller companies. I know we do it where basically everyone wears different hats within the company. I am, I am like the marketing person that posts on social media and communicates with like uh, coordinates with like the website and, and different things, helps with like the webinars and technical uh, presentations. There's other people that help with like employee engagement and making sure everyone is feeling included, uh, there is other committees for recruiting, and everyone is basically an engineer on top of doing all these responsibilities. And I think it not only helps you develop those skills, but it feels like you are more part of the company and you have like a little more ownership in the company and the success of the company. So I think that's a really important point that I think especially the bigger companies do a lot. Have you, have you seen maybe bigger companies apply that successfully? And how does that translate to like smaller companies? I mean, I think bigger companies, I do see that they have committees and initiatives that people can get onto. You know, they probably have a little more flexibility there financially to have a few more unbillable hours for their staff that they right. can absorb. <clears throat> but I do think like, you know, talking about that for a minute, you know, utilization and your billable hours, I think companies of any size need to, need to be willing to give every employee a certain number of unbillable hours to be able to engage in things, everything that we talked about today learning and development, right. volunteering, you know, community outreach, because I think that that enriches their staff. I think that it makes them happier and I think it's going to want to make them stay with their company longer. And I think what companies fail to realize is that they want to squeeze, you know, 99.9% .9 billable out of everybody in their company. And the problem with that is, is that if you work someone like that and they leave your company, you know what it costs you to hire someone else and train them and the time that you lose and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you need to think about that. Would you rather have employees that are maybe 95% billable, but they're volunteering, they're in committees, they're happier, they're enjoying the workplace, or do you want to have people that are 100% billable and they're just getting burnt out and then they want to go work somewhere else? So I think, I know it's hard in the moment to say, oh, we really can't afford the, these non-billable hours, but I think you need to think about it in the long term. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. I think there needs to be a balance between your engineering work and and your passion or any other things you want to do, especially within the company. And there needs to be room to not be like a hundred percent doing engineering work because you're going to get tired. You're going to get super, super burnt out. And it's just really hard to live like that for a really long time. Uh, I know, I mean, you, you as an engineer have probably noticed that especially weeks or months that we do just a lot of work. And after that, you just exhausted. Like you're just putting so much energy into getting this project over the hump, submitting all these plans and everything, um, that after that, there needs to be like a, a period of like resetting, maybe working on some side projects, maybe working on uh, something that is not as, as mentally challenging to recover. And especially uh, when you're a small company, you may not have all the resources, but there needs to be a, a balance between the two. I think that's, that's super, super important. Yeah, need balance. Um, so let, let's just recap here. I just want, to just hear from you, any advice for college students that are trying to find their first job? Uh, what are some of these skills over just technical skills, just soft skills that are going to help them basically find the first job, be successful in the first 90 days, and ultimately just set them up for an amazing career? Yeah, so I think, Luis, 
it goes back to everything we already talked about. When you're in college, you need to be volunteering. You need to get involved in chapter mm-hmm. associations. That's going to help you build your skills. It's going to help you become a better speaker, which is going to help you interview better, which is going to help you be better when you get your job. <laughs> so really, honestly, everything we've been talking about probably applies to every part of your career, including college, quite frankly. Um, right. But I do think that the most important thing in college is to get internship experience, work with an engineering company. It's the number one thing because when companies are hiring engineers, you're always going to look at engineers that have experience in industry with internships over people that don't. It's just the nature of it. Like, you know, someone Mm -hmm. would rather hire someone that's already practiced a little bit than if they haven't. So do whatever you have to do over your summers to get a job, even if you have to work for very low pay with an engineering company as, as opposed to working somewhere else where you can get paid more, take the engineering job because that experience is going to be invaluable to you personally in terms of yourself and your career, but also that experience on your resume is going to be invaluable when you go to work for a company. And quite frankly, most engineers that I know, <clears throat> I can't give you a percentage, but a lot of them got hired by the company that they were doing the internship for including myself. So <laughs> right. um, I really think that that's a critical component of you know getting your career off to a good start and do everything we talked about. Volunteer in school, you know, make yourself uncomfortable by giving talks, take a public speaking course, do all those types of things. And I think that that can really, really benefit you. Yeah, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting that you mentioned that because I basically did the complete opposite. As an international student, it was really hard to find an internship in engineering. So I didn't get my first full-time or like engineering job was after I graduated my master's degree. So on my resume, all those jobs were maintenance, uh, cleaning bathrooms, were uh, working for like a concrete ready mix company, uh, were for like a project manager at a, the electronics company. Uh, so none of them really related to any of the things I wanted to do. But what I did was I took those jobs, I learned as much as I could from the soft skills, I need to be on time, manage teams, um, do my work independently, all those things. And I transferred them into my resume in a way that whoever wanted to hire me see that I have those skills. And on top of that, I showed that I volunteered a lot with engineering borders. I was doing engineering reports. I was doing all this volunteering. Um, so I think while those internships are super important, especially if you want to be in structural engineering, which is a really uh, technical field, there's other ways to go around it. And a lot of people are, are afraid to put those kind of jobs in their resume because they're not engineering related. But you need to craft your resume in a way that you're showing your employer that you have these skills. Because the technical skills are fairly easy to, to teach and you learn them in school and everything. But the soft skills that I think are super important to learn and, and show that you are able to do it. Yeah, I agree with you. And if someone ever, if I ever hear from an engineer that says, I wasn't able to get an internship in college, what should I do? I always tell them to take their jobs that they had and write them in a way that will kind of tell the engineering companies how they can, you know, how they took value from that. Like, for example, if I worked at, you know, a fast food place and I was serving food to people, I might say like, you know, I really learned the value of customer service and interacting with customers. And that's going to help me dealing with clients as an engineering company. So I think that you should always make sure that you're speaking to people and letting them know the value that you can bring to the table, however you got that value, right? Whether it was an engineering company or not. Um, Obviously you want to get the internship, but if you can't, you know, don't think that, you know, don't discredit, you know, what you've done because you always learn stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with that. Um, so it's been a lot of fun talking to you. Uh, I, I like to end the episode uh, talking about like some book recommendations. I've been into reading a lot. Uh, what are some of your favorite, favorite, maybe two or three books that will teach, especially younger engineers, the skills they need to be successful in their careers? Yeah, so I, I read a lot. I've got about thousands of books here, <laughs> but I would say that a couple of my favorite authors, Cal Newport is a very yeah. a favorite author of mine. He's, his, I guess his leading book was Deep Work is the one that a lot of people know him by. But I read one of his his most recent book recently, A World Without Email, mm-hmm. which is a really important book that talks about, you know, we have all these ways to get in touch with people today, Teams and Slack and all this stuff. The problem is though, is we need to try to do deep work. So we need hours right. to ourselves to do work. If we keep getting distracted, we're, we're missing out on doing deep work. And I feel that that's very applicable in the world of engineering. 
And I feel mm-hmm. that we need to manage these tools very well now. And so that's definitely something that I would definitely, definitely highly recommend. Um, other, uh, another book that I read uh, recently was called uh, 4,000 Weeks. Can't remember the author's name right now, but it's about how really like the average person lives for 4,000 weeks. Mm-hmm. And so basically what that means is like, what are you doing with your life and how, and again, he talks about how a lot of us are running around. We're so busy, like, you know, so it's kind of a productivity book, but it's more of like a, from a life perspective, which is interesting. The last thing too, is I'll, I'll mention my own book only because it's very specific to engineering, engineer your own success, seven key elements to creating an extraordinary engineering career. I literally walk through these elements, a lot of them that you and I talked about today in the yeah. context of engineering. So how can you develop your communication skills as an engineer? You know, how can you right. develop your networking skills as an engineer? Um, and so I think any books that you can get kind of related specifically to engineering would be ben- very beneficial to you. Maybe there's a career book in your discipline. Um, and, and I would say just keep, always read if you can. And if you can't mm-hmm. listen to audio books, everything is available on audio today. Um, but I've learned so many things from books. And I think the key thing about it is trying to apply them after you've read the book. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's super true. And I have my own system that maybe I'll talk in a different episode. Uh, but yeah, I, I've been a lot into reading this, especially this year. Last year, I wanted to read like 18 books. I ended up reading like 12, 13, which is a low number. But this year I'm like, I wrote like read like six books in the first like six weeks, which is way more than I've ever read. Uh, there's so much value in books that it's, it's a, it's a very affordable way to gain a lot of knowledge. And, and again, those books that you mentioned uh, are amazing. And uh, I haven't read your book specifically, but the other two, I, they're in my bookshelf right now. Like I'm going to read them this year. Um, so yeah, those books are, that are really good recommendation. I just have one last question for you before we end the episode. And that's how can we continue engineering our future? Well, I think that we need to continue to build our skills, continuous learning, continuous improvement. Our projects are only going to become more difficult and more complex, which means we need to be more well-rounded, right? And I think that I always like the uh, the Zen proverb about, you know, you always want to have an empty cup. So if you think your cup is full, if you think you don't need to learn anymore, you're in trouble. But, you know, I always like to think like my cup is empty and, you know, I can just keep filling up my cup. And so I think when you when you get to the point even if you've been practicing for 40 years as an engineer, there's still things that you can learn. I think you need to keep the mindset of, I want to learn more. Things are changing. Technology is changing. We had COVID. There's infrastructure funding coming. There's all new things we need to learn and adapt to. And that the only way that we're going to really engineer our future is if we can all continue to adapt and learn new things. Yeah. And I think the mindset of just being a lifelong learner, um, I, you probably heard that in school. You probably heard that as an engineer. Especially if you're a professional engineer, you need to keep up your license by attending webinars and, and continually learn um, the latest technologies and, and methods and everything. So I think that that's super important. Um, again, thank you, Anthony, for coming to the podcast. Uh, it was just a pleasure talking to you. I've been following you for a while. We have connected on social media and it's just a great um, opportunity just to, to just talk with you directly about all these amazing topics. I've been listening to all your podcasts for a little while now and they're all just amazing for engineers. Uh, from civil engineering for just engineers that want to become managers uh, you have a lot of great content online i think that's it, it, it's taking a lot of work i know for sure yeah. um, and a lot of time and obviously you have now a team that supports all of that but it's something that as an engineer you don't really see a lot of people having that much content on, on the internet uh, just trying to help as many people as possible so uh, again thank, thank you. you for all you do and I just where can people connect with you reach out to you if they have any other questions or just just network with you. Yeah. I mean, you can go to our website, engineeringmanagementinstitute.org. We've got all the podcasts, all the YouTube channels. We have a YouTube channel about the FE and PE exams as well. For those of you that want to get your license and also you can connect with me on LinkedIn, just go to LinkedIn type, you know, Anthony Fasano, you'll find me. Um, I put a lot of all the content that Luis is talking about. I constantly put out through our LinkedIn, my LinkedIn profile, our company's LinkedIn, uh, profile and you can get all the information you want there. I always tell engineers take advantage of it because all of the stuff we put out there is free, all of our content and you can get it, you can use it. And I hope that, and I really believe that there's all on our website is free content that can help you grow as much as you want in your career. Yeah. Again, thank you so much for coming to the podcast and it was just a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for having me, Luis.